Okie dokie, who should I be? What's the good life? Uh, for this week, we read the first book of the Nicomachean Ethics, uh, which, as I was just mentioning before class, doesn't really get the full project of virtue ethics out on the page. It, it happens really in like book two and later, but it sets the stage and the foundation for the development of uh, virtue ethics. So what we read for today is really important um, and interesting argument that um, inspires what I'll be talking about for most of our class today. So I've split up um, tonight's lecture into two halves, the first half being um, sort of a general overview of like what a virtue is and what we're interested in these things, virtues, uh, why we're interested in them as objects of normative evaluation. Normative just meaning like I can evaluate saying like this is good or this is bad in terms of say like the consequences, right? Consequentialism or in terms of the rational duty that one has to do something in ontology or alternatively because it's consistent with virtue, right? So we'll talk a lot today about what virtues are and how they operate as uh, like normative objects. Uh, and then after we understand what virtues are, we'll take one more step back to seeing the, um, it will, will interpose in Aristotle's arguments for uh, the importance of virtue and, and the place that virtue has in a system of ethics generally, which is what we read for book one. So um, before we do any of that though, let's just do a little bit of recap of last time. Uh, we read modern moral philosophy, right? Um, and we were told by Anscombe that uh, especially the old Kaji, English kind from Sidgwick and Hare of moral philosophy was stupid is like her quote word, right? Um, the problems with the ontological thinking and utilitarian or consequentialist thinking are unresolvable, pedantic. We saw a lot of these, right? With the trolley cases going back and forth. There's really no right answer. There's just a bunch of moral agony that you experience in trying to think through these problems, um, at least with respect to these systems of ethics. Now, I'm not sure that a virtue ethical system would be any better at helping you answer the question to pull the lever or not. In fact, it probably would be just as vexing uh, as a virtue ethicist, but it's sort of a problem that a virtue ethicist shouldn't need to care all that much about, right? It, it's, a, it's a problem that's particularly pressing uh, because the utilitarian and the deontologist should say, like, in every situation, we can tell you what the good action is or what the bad action is. The virtue ethicist is a little less concerned with uh, what are good and bad actions and more concerned with what are good and bad character traits. Uh, so sort of like a, I mean, it's still an issue if you ask the virtue ethicist, like, what do you do? Do you pull the lever or not? Um, at least theoretically, conceptually, it's, it's a bit more of a non-issue because it's dealing with choice rather than behavior character trait. Um, so Anscombe at the end of her paper says, look, th there's a better way to do normative evaluation. There's a better way to think through these kinds of problems to think about ethics, which is um, to, hello, are you working? To decide on what counts as good and bad based on an emotive system, one that uses the language that is descriptive, that tells us about the way that the world is, what we care about in the world, um, rather than saying something is bad, you say it's corrupt or uh, whatever. The, the, the sort of like metaphor of emotive character-based language speaks more to you know what we really think of as good and bad, and if we can base a system of evaluation and ethics on that kind of language, which comes again from character traits, who and what and why we are. Uh, then we'll be much better off than the modern moral philosophers and philosophies have left us. Okay, so um, let's just cover these problems real quick. So there's this really cool paper called Moral Saints by Susan Wolf, pictured here. This is a younger picture of her. Um, so in the paper, Wolf asks us to imagine the perfect utilitarian, right? So uh, Bentham and Mill sit down. Uh, and they're given access to a cloning machine and they can program into this cloning machine like whatever personality traits they want. And they make this clone of theirs a perfect utilitarian maximizer, meaning that they always can and do uh, the action that maximizes utility in the way that they best see fit. This is like the moral saint of utilitarianism, like the, the person who does it better than everybody else. Is this a good person? Right. Is this the sort of person that we want to look up to? Similarly, 
um, we could imagine a He's breaking a perfect deontologist, right? A perfect Kantian. Kant does the same thing with his Klein machine. Uh, the moral saint of a Kantian groundwork for the metaphysics of morals kind of character. Is this the sort of person who we would want to count as our hero? Would we say that this is this person? When I think of a good person, I think of the deontological saint or the utilitarian saint, right? And like superhero utilitarian man is frying the frontal lobes of a criminal trying to steal a woman's purse taking their organs and distributing them to five people. And that seems a little ugly, like, you know, where's due process, right? Uh, and your Kantian invites the ax murder and might even offer him a cup of coffee because why shouldn't you? Uh, I, th I think offering someone who enters your house a cup of coffee is affirmable under the categorical imperative. Therefore, when you also invite the ax murder in to murder your friend, you give him a cup of coffee because it's your duty. One piece of the ontology and down <laughs> yeah, right. So, so these moral saints, uh, Susan Wolf says, like, look, th these people are absurd, and we wouldn't like them if they are around us, right? The person who never lies and always tells the truth, the the one who um, is always thinking about the greater good and never about you or themselves or really anything, um, only about the mathematical calculation of utility. Um, these are not our sorts of heroes, not the sort of people that we care about. And this is kind of like a, a reductio of the position of, of these moral philosophies, meaning that it's, uh, it, it's it makes the, the position absurd. That like, if this is the, the maximal, like the, the most that you could get out of this moral system, the, the perfect moral person is not really someone that we like or think is good at all, uh, then doesn't that make your whole system kind of strange and bunk, right, absurd. Um, I just keep breaking. I just put new batteries in it. Such a shame. So when we think of good people that we idolize, they aren't like that. Um, so for instance, who's someone that you idolize, morally idolize? Nobody. We don't have moral idols. How about online? Just like a good person. Martin Luther King. Yeah. Didn't he like cheat on his wife or something? Right. Like, like he had a whole bunch of sexual indiscretions. So like, you know, great civil rights hero, but um, what, what's the expression like sand in his boots or like feet, I, I don't know, something like that. Right. So it, it, for it, we're all like finite, imperfect people. Um, we all make our mistakes and our choices sometimes don't turn out in the way that we mean them to. Yeah, like, the world is not one that affords moral perfection. Um, and for any moral exemplar, uh, it's not the failures that we worry about. It's what makes them so good. It's the things that they do that we do consider good. We take them as exemplars and we uh, model our behavior, not on them as like a holistic person, the good and the bad, but on them as our hero, which is just the good, right? Um, and the moral saint of utilitarianism and of deontology uh, is not someone that you would want to model yourself after, right? Because uh, what makes them good is what makes them so strange and uh, sometimes awful, right? Inviting the ax murder in for a cup of coffee, that's a little strange, right? Um, so this is, again, like an argument and, and just to sort of reflect what some of the prima facie issues just like right out there. Uh, with deontology and utilitarianism are and why uh, Anscombe is inspired and so many other now philosophers um, in trying to develop a virtue ethical system to um, circumnavigate the strangeness of these other alternative positions. Okay, so what is a virtue? Um, Linda Zygzebski is a virtue theorist. She works mostly on virtue epistemology, so like how to know things virtuously. Uh, so knowledge isn't about justified true belief, like what we talked about with Descartes, but it's about knowing in the right sort of way, having the right sorts of um, uh, mental properties, uh, epistemological characteristics, like open-mindedness or uh, creativity and these sorts of 
uh, character traits. The, the knower is the person who has these properties. This is her career. She was one of my mentors in, in undergrad. She says that a virtue can be defined as a deep and enduring acquired excellence of a person involving a characteristic motivation to produce a certain desired end and reliable success in bringing about that end. So we can break this definition up into um, four and really five conditions. So first, a virtue is an acquired excellence of the soul. Uh, it's like some deep lasting feature, uh, like you know, soul broadly construed, whatever it is that makes you you, um, whether you think that's a soul or just you know, like neurons firing, whatever, like the, the part of you that you're talking about when you say, um, this is a feature of me that is, um, you know, uh, writ in stone. It's just a part of who and what I am, right? That sort of thing. A virtue is an excellence of that part of you. Um, it's also an acquired uh, process that involves time and work on a part of the agent. You don't just like pull the lever or not and choose the right answer in order to be good. To have one of these virtues, you got to learn it. You got to habituate. It's, it's a character trait that you build over time that's developed, right? Um, that there's, there's no character trait that just occurs um, we we uh, have to train them sort of like skills. Uh, Jesus and Santa are moral exemplars. Um, Jesus, I get. Uh, Santa, I suppose, is generous. He does run a sweatshop of elves, though, so that's a little bit of a, you know, glass house. Um, so uh, three, virtue is not simply a skill, but uh, more uh, one with intrinsic value. Um, so it's not just a skill, it's the, uh, the character trait that, that a virtue is the sort of uh, kind of, kind of is uh, trained like a skill, but is not itself a skill. Um, because a skill is for the sake of some external success. The reason or purpose of a virtue uh, as a character trait is to acquire some sort of intrinsic value, right? A value that isn't for the sake of like getting paid or, um, you know, like uh, acquiring some good or means or whatever, but rather uh, of um, making my soul or my person excellent to flourish, to live well, right? It's something that's good for me in, in, in itself without needing any external um, ends. Um, and a virtue has a motivation component. So a virtue isn't just a capacity, but it's something that sort of motivates us, moves us to act in the right sort of way. It inspires our practical reasoning. It's not just something that we're capable of doing, but it is a, like a generative cause of what we do that causes us to do good, right? To act virtuously. Uh, and then the fifth hidden one, which is kind of fun, um, we'll do a fun case, um, is that, and, and this is a controversial one, okay? So this is like Zygzebski, it comes out of her argument. Um, and I, I kind of agree with it, but we'll do the example and see what you think, because it is controversial. Um, so that a virtue should also be successful in bringing about its ends and inspiring the, the goals that it does, that the kinds of actions that it does. Uh, it, it should not only inspire those, but it should inspire them such that they come out well and actually happen. Um, so if you have all of the character traits, but you know, like the world conspires against you at every turn and corner and you don't ever actually do any good with the virtuous character that you have, you're no good, which might, which is why it's controversial. You might think alternatively, right? So, but that is sort of loaded into Zygzebski's definition here, uh, which again, we'll cover. Okay, so uh, let's focus on one first. We'll like look at all of these and break them down a little bit. So virtue is an acquired excellence of the soul. What does this mean? Well, um, Virtues are kind of faculties or traits, right? I've described them as character traits. They're, they're features of us, like uh, to be courageous, to be open-minded, uh, to be magnanimous or generous like Santa Claus, right? Um, and some argue that virtues are akin to natural capacities, like uh, you can just be good at running or at, uh, I don't know, playing chess or whatever. You'd be like a prodigy of some skill or whatever. Um, you'd be naturally intelligent or strong or compassionate, whatever, right? Um, Aristotle disagrees. Aristotle does not think that virtue is a kind of natural capacity. Now, we might have sort of in us the makings of these virtuous character traits, but it's really important for Aristotle's version of virtue ethics, uh, and he does get into some contemporary trouble for this, that the character traits are honed and um, 
uh, measured and trained in the right sort of way so that they produce the proper ends. Uh, now, the right sort of training, the environment in which that training can happen and the ends for which these character traits are for the sake of, uh, Aristotle argued in a way that was relative to his time, though that's not essential to the framework of the argument. It, what is essential is like this character trait sort of growing that, that we have to develop these traits from our natural capacities or natural incapacities um, in order to achieve certain ends that are for the sake of excellences of the soul that make the world a better place. Now, if you're from the ancient Greek world, those might look a little bit different from what they look like now. Um, but again, some controversy there that we'll get deeper into later on. Um, but the idea is that uh, these excellences, these virtues are not, not you, like you're not born courageous. Um, you might be born with like the makings of courage, but you have to be trained in how to use that uh, emotion in the right sort of way uh, in what's called like the mean, right? You can't be uh, excessively courageous or deficiently courageous. You have to like hit the mean for the situation as it's called for, and this requires training. So you might have the the makings of being a courageous person, but being specifically courageous takes training and work. Um, so you earn your virtue. Uh, and by earning your virtue, it's praiseworthy in a way that natural capacities are not, right? So we can say that person is virtuous and like good for you, like you did it. Um, but someone who's just naturally uh, sort of inclined to virtuous action, you might say, well, you got beginner's luck or something, right? Um, so the, the, the excellence isn't intrinsically uh, excellent in the case of like the beginner's luck or the, the natural capacity. Um, you want something that's like reliable in producing and in disposing one to good action. And this is what makes a virtue and excellence deep down in the soul. So uh, as Aristotle says, we have the faculties by nature, but we are not made good or bad by nature. Now, who does this sound kind of like that we've read? Talking about human nature. Sounds like no, neither of them did, but it's something similar, at least to Mungza, right? So what I see in this, we have the faculties by nature, we have the sprouts, right? And this is why you get um, an analogy between Mungza's view on human nature to Aristotle's virtue ethics. They're, they're just like they go hand in hand. Because for Aristotle, too, we have these natural capacities, and he doesn't, you know, uh, focus on the natural capacities to the same extent uh, that Mungza does, right? Uh, but um, he agrees, we have these natural capacities and the capacities are not themselves virtues, but can be developed, can be grown, right? Like the sprouts into virtue um, or into vice alternatively. Uh, so human nature is neither good nor bad. It's uh, full of capacity for either capacity. The Greek word I think is dunamis, D-U-N-A-M-I-S. Um, so as Aristotle says, it is plain that none of the moral virtues arise in us by nature for nothing that exists by nature can form a habit contrary to its nature. For instance, a stone, which by nature moves downwards, cannot be habituated to move upwards. Not even if one tries to train it by throwing it up at 10,000 times, it's just going to keep rolling down. Uh, nor can fire be habituated to move downwards, nor can anything else that by nature behaves in one way be trained to behave in another, neither by nature then, nor contrary to nature, do the virtues arise in us. Rather, we are adapted by nature to receive them and are made perfect by habit. So we train ourselves right through habit to uh, develop these natural capacities into what eventually become virtues and thus excellences of the soul. Um, and it's this active sort of training that makes them so excellent. Uh, but virtues also have vices, right? So Aristotle is not uh, closed off to the idea of you can train yourself to be a pretty vicious person as well. You, you may not be virtuous in every case, um, but through habit, you might train yourself to be kind of a jerk, right? Um, so uh, imagine the defensive driver versus the aggressive driver, the way that they habituate themselves. Um, lead them into different kinds of driving, even though they both have a natural capacity for turning a wheel and hitting gas pedal, brake pedal, right? Um, and we might say that one kind of driving is more virtuous than other, more vicious, right? Uh, and um, 
yeah, there, there's no like amoral version of a virtue. There's just uh, the virtue and then it's excess and deficiency and vice. Okay. Um, so I've been talking about excess and deficiency. What does Aristotle really say about it? Well, um, say take like a virtue like courage, right? To be courageous is uh, one of Aristotle's big virtues. Uh, it's one he spends a lot of time talking about. What is it to be courageous? Well, it's not to be um, cowardly, right? Nor is it to be uh, brash right? or, or brazen, or like to, to be overly courageous, right? Um, so I think his example is uh, like Achilles or something in the Trojan War, um, or maybe just like a, a hoplite, right? So you're like spearmen in uh, formation. The cowardly hoplite lets everybody else go forward and he like breaks formations like, I'm not doing this. And this is a vice to be cowardly. Similarly, if you are in excess of this character trait or emotion rather than deficiency um, that leads to cowardice, if you're in excess, then the hoplite runs forward and you know, like blood rage is ready to go poke the eyes out of all of his enemies uh, and then gets killed, right? So um, in the case of cowardice and uh, uh, brashness, you have an excess and deficiency of the same emotion whose mean hit right at the center is courage where you stand your ground, but you stand your ground with, you know, your, your uh, brothers in arms, so to speak, okay? So uh, a virtue is a character trader. So this emotive quality that hits the mean between excess and deficiency. That makes sense? Um, another one, anger, uh, righteous anger is a virtue. So being irascible, way too angry is an excess of anger. Likewise, being uh, timid or meek um, when you should stand up for yourself is a, another vice. It's, it's a kind of deficiency. But righteous anger, the one that uh, hits the mean where you say, uh, no, you spelled my name wrong on the Starbucks cup and you better get it right. You know, um, That kind of anger is the virtuous sort, um, or maybe not in that example, but you know, as it goes. Uh, so a virtue is a character trait that's a kind of excellence of the soul that in action, when it's performed, it's, it's this habituous this disposition to push us towards a particular kind of action that hits the mean in the situation that's called for. Um, and well, how do we know what this mean is? That well, our habit um, helps us, the character trait sort of generally trends towards producing the right kinds of action. Um, but what we didn't read for today is that there's also this term called phrenesis, practical wisdom. Uh, and phrenesis is, uh, another kind of skill ingrained kind of intellectual contemplative virtue uh, where you just kind of get it, right? It's the intuition, moral intuition, so to speak. Um, and one develops phrenesis by training in the right sort of way, being in the right sort of environment, according to Aristotle, um, living the virtuous life. Um, okay, so two, a virtue is acquired by a process that involves time and work on a part of the agent. Okay, so virtues are achieved. We talked about this. This is what makes them excellences. As Aristotle says, virtue only follows from a firm and unchangeable character, that it's something about you that isn't wishy-washy, but is like a definable feature of who and what you are. Um, by involving our intentions, we're responsible for our virtues in a way that we might not be about skills. So um, we care about the development of virtues in a way that we don't care about the development of skills. We care about skills for the sake of acquiring the success that they lead to, but we're, we care about acquiring virtues for the sake of the goodness that it does for us. And this is another important feature that makes it an excellence that sort of loads in more of that weight of the, the moral value, um, the balance to it. Uh, so it's not simply a skill. Uh, Skills are kinds of capacities, like the ability to skate on ice, but what does skating on ice do for uh, the good of your soul, of who you are, what kind of person you are, the, the good of your society, the political interactions that you have in your everyday, right? Um, virtues are more like conscientious habits. They're um, not just an ability to skate or not, but something that's loaded and preloaded, like a spring in you to be called forth when afforded by the world to act in our sort of way. So uh, you have a capacity to uh, cross the street when the walk sign turns on, but you have a conscientious habit to help 
the little old lady in the walker across the street, like blocking traffic or whatever for her, because you know that it's going to take her longer to get across than there's amount of there's time to walk. Uh, if you are virtuous in, in that sort of way, right? Um, so you have a capacity versus this conscientious habit. The conscientious habit is what fires off and tells you like, okay, I should do this. And this is like a good thing to do. Um, as opposed to just like the capacity that doesn't inspire you to do good, but is you know, sort of a prerequisite for. So virtues and skills are related, so they come apart. Oh, what did I do? Um, let's see. Good, okay, so four. Uh, virtues also have a motivation component. Like I was just saying that it, the, the conscientious habit is something that inspires us to act that sort of calls us to it. Um, so glass is disposed to shatter when hit with a hard object, doors are disposed to open when operated on correctly. Um, do either of these disposed objects have desires to act as such? Well, no, right? That they're doors and glass, right? That they have in them this capacity whereas virtue is attached to this kind of inspiration, um, to this kind of practical reasoning motion. Um, and there's some interesting work too uh, in contemporary philosophy. Julie Annis from University of Arizona has this book, Intelligent Virtue, where she argues that um, in addition to these other conditions that we've been talking about, a virtue isn't really a full virtue until you come to the point where you no longer have to think about it, right? So let's take the, the granny walking across the street example. Uh, if you see that she's there with her walker, the walk sign's about to go on, and then it goes on and you think to yourself, hmm, should I help her across? Like, is this what's good? What, what would be the mean of the, the, the emotion that hits the, the virtue rather than the deficiency or the excess? Um, if you think like that, then you're on the right track, but you're missing the virtue, right? The virtue needs to be this like built-in character trait that goes, right? So it, though a conscientious habit related to our desires and intentions to develop these natural capacities into um, full-blown uh, uh, unavailing character traits is uh, according, like argued by Julianus, also something that must happen automatically, which is kind of interesting. It's a conscientious thing that has to fire off of its own. Um, again, this is contemporary interpretation, so readily controversial and able to be argued against. But I, I, I sort of, I kind of agree, right? That, that the virtue should just lead us to act. Um, we shouldn't overthink about it. And if we do, then we're missing out on, on opportunity. And, and it's all about the kinds of actions that we're inspired to perform based on our characters. So if we overthink it, then we miss out and we don't perform those actions. So how can we be considered excellent? Um, Oh, okay. So another reason um, that uh, it's important to have intention built into the development of virtue rather than just to have like this capacity, this ability to do one thing or another, but rather to be inspired to act um, is that we might also accidentally act virtuously, right? The beginner's look kind of case, uh, but not be motivated by the end of our action. So you should be intrinsically motivated for the sake of the excellence of your character to um, when given the opportunity to help someone across the street who needs it, to just help them. Uh, but it might be, I, I don't know why, but you might just sort of accidentally help that person across the street anyways for the sake of some other end. Um, like maybe they're a, a rich dowager or something and you'll get written into the will if you help them across the street, right? Something like that. Um, so we might be accidentally moved to act virtuously. We might act in a way consistent with virtuous action, though built in, our, we lack the character trait of virtue that should be what inspires us to act as such. Um, so it's important that virtue is sourced in our agency and why we do and what we do, who we are and why we do it. Um, and so we're motivated by a desire to move about, uh, uh, to, to bring about a world in which these ends are realized. Um, So being motivated by a desire to save others, so you volunteer at ground zero, or motivated by a desire to help them suffering, so you work for a shelter for an afternoon. Without the right motivations, we can end up with the following problem, right? You gotta have the right motivations. 
You gotta have the right internal stuff as well as the right active external like actions in the world in order for the, the character trait to find its real um, grip and texture in the world such that we can say, ah, that's a good person. Right? And this is where we should start to be thinking like maybe there's, there is a success condition. Maybe in order to be virtuous, you really do have to be active in the world. You don't just have to have these internal character traits with the right sort of dispositions and inspirations and desires for producing good, but you also have to um, be successful in how they fire off and work. So let's imagine for a moment the burning building um, and uh, the firefighters think everyone has been saved from the building, but, oh wait, oh no, there's baby Yoda. Group, group, group is that it? Baby, group, group? Grogu. Grogu, yeah. Baby Yoda Grogu um, does his cute little squeaking thing and someone says, oh no, he's still there, so go help him, right? Um, so a firefighter bravely, courageously, um, runs up the burning stairs as the, the rafters of the building are falling all around them and um, grabs baby Yoda, but neither of them survive. It's sad, right? Yeah. Our best intentions aren't usually enough to produce the ends that virtues aim at. And this is why controversially some accept this hidden fifth condition. Right, that you have to be successful as well, that the firefighter might have uh, been perfectly at the mean of courage, um, not cowardly, wouldn't have run in, not brash, would have uh, you know, not worried about putting on his mask before he ran, like assume that the firefighter put on the mask before they ran in. Um, but when the firefighter runs upstairs, the stairs collapse and kills everyone inside. Um, they, they did everything right, with respect to the virtue, hitting the mean, um, having the sort of character trait that inspires the action, but Grogu, RIP, firefighter RIP. Um, so even best laid plans, intentions, best laid character traits that inspire excellence of baby Yoda and men off to go awry, right? Um, so what do we think? Do, do we think that like virtue condition or success condition of virtue? Um, in order to be a virtuous, is, is the firefighter a virtuous person for having hit the mean and, you know, like put on their mask and run in the building? Are they courageous? Or does their courage actually need to succeed for them to count as a courageous person? I'm inclined to say they're courageous. Yeah. yeah. I think the intention is important too. Like it's just as important as like the action. So maybe I was like below their left. Well, so is it just as important? Because the action failed, right? Yeah. But the intention is there, yeah. but the action fails. So if they're just as important, you're missing half of the picture, right? In this case, they failed because of something out of their control, which seems different. Yeah. Like if the firefighter made a mistake and died, that would be different. Right, like didn't put on their yeah, helmet, right? If they did everything right, then yeah. Yeah. The online, do you guys have intuitions about this success case? No intuitions. You're without intuitions. You know, it, it, Aristotle didn't say that there was a virtue of responding to questions in Zoom calls, but, you know, product of his times. Okay, let's move on. Um, okay, so here's what a virtue is. This is how the virtue ethicist morally evaluates. What they are saying is good or bad that are not specific actions, but the actions that are produced by these reliable, uh, habitual disposed traits of character that are reflective of excellences of the soul, that people have worked for, that are successful in making the world a better place, that, uh, you know, cause people to do good. Um, now, what we call good or, or how we know that a character trait is for the sake of making the world a better place, what that is supposed to mean, the world being a better place, 
um, is what we read in the Nicomachean Ethics for today, right? It's happiness right? for Aristotle. But the, the structure of a virtue ethics is a, a structure in which um, evaluations are done on the basis of these things, these virtues, right? Okay. So some examples of virtues, uh, these are Aristotle's courage, temperance, liberality, magnificence, uh, magnanimity, ambition, patience, friendliness, truthfulness, wit, modesty, righteousness. Um, so all of these are supposed to be character traits, like a, a motive spectra upon which there is a deficiency and an excess and the virtue and the mean, right? So uh, let's take truthfulness, for example. Truthfulness is the mean of What's the deficiency of truthfulness? Lying. Lying. What's an excess of truthfulness? Telling the axe murderer your friend is inside. Telling the axe murderer your friend is inside. Or that, um, God, this shirt looks terrible on me today, right? That would hurt my feelings. That's an excess of truthfulness. Don't say that, right? Um, how about uh, uh, patience? What's a deficiency of patience? Yeah, impatience. How about uh, excess? Can there be an excess of patience? Yeah, so maybe, maybe like passivity or something, right? Um, but patience is good. It, it, you know, we're not getting irritated when we're waiting in line forever, that sort of thing. Um, just like enjoying the audiobook as we're sitting in traffic um, rather than screaming at the cars around us. Um, so some of these, it, it can be hard to pick out excesses and deficiencies, and, and they may be controversial, we'll learn that they, they exist. Um, so you, know, you get some interesting discussion, like people, philosophers today will spend their uh, whole career um, talking about one particular virtue and um, its excesses and deficiencies and the structure and you know cognitive underpinnings and all this sort of stuff. Um, so if you're interested in this, I mean, that there are careers in just saying like, what the heck is wit, right? What's an excess of wit? Like being like a fool? A deficiency is being boorish or something? Yeah. Um, there are also intellectual virtues. So uh, this is something that I haven't talked about much, but uh, we'll just, and we'll just sort of like barely briefly touch when we get into Aristotle, um, is the, the intellectual virtues. So for Aristotle, there's a tripartite soul, which I'll define later, but the idea is that you have like a, desiring part, sort of human body moving through the world, needs things, wants things part. And there's also this like rational capacity part. Um, and there are virtues of both the virtues of our bodies acting in the world are these character virtues. Um, and intellectual virtues are epistemic. They have to do with how we know things and how the mind works and operates. They're contemplative virtues. Uh, and there's some interesting problems in Aristotle with uh, how he prioritizes the importance and value of the contemplative virtues over the character ones, but you couldn't like have any of the epistemic ones without also having a virtuous character. Uh, so that leads to interesting debate because if like you sat around and thought all day long, but you're not making the world a better one. Um, unless of course you are Aristotle in the academy or one of the other philosophers who literally did that, right? They sat around and thought all day and made the world a better place. Uh, but maybe not so much or as much anymore, okay? So this is what Aristotle's system of virtue ethics is based on, um, which we will get into now. And before we do that, why don't we take five minutes? So go stretch your legs, um, do what you will, and uh, we'll be back in five. Welcome back. Here we go. We're back and at it, ready to talk about book one of the Nicomachean Ethics. So, oh, hello. Plato was, uh, Aristotle was Plato's graduate student for about 20 years, which makes it no surprise that Plato uh, disagreed with everything, or Aristotle disagreed with everything that Plato wrote. Um, and many of his, or his, his like books are direct refutations of Platonic principles, theories, theses, um, but they 
were like, you know, colleagues for 20 years in the academy, um, inspiring the future and um, uh, like progress of Western philosophy, especially in Greece and the ancient world. Um, Aristotle is probably one of the most brilliant humans to have ever existed. Uh, as I was mentioning before class, this is part one of two uh, of his uh, complete works uh, of which he invents things like physics and biology and logic uh, and uh, formal ethics that we're looking at. Um, uh, rhetorical style, right? It just, I mean, the guy picked up and in, like, there was no biology before Aristotle. He was the first one to look at um, animals and plants and think, hey, this is kind of interesting. I should figure out what the principles of these things are to do a logos, the principles therein of bios of life. So doing botany and biology and whatnot. Um, and he was also the advisor and teacher of Alexander the Great, fun fact. Um, he has a whole book that is like his lectures to Alexander um, and uh, was run out of Athens uh, in his later life because of this after Alexander died and the uh, dynasty sort of split apart back into its original or more and less original, the largely more Hellenistic parts. Um, Aristotle gets run out of town because the Athenians did not like Alexander. Um, and principally for the sake of our lecture, he had a son, Nicomachus, who, for whom he wrote the Nicomachean Ethics. Uh, and so this is sort of like father to son, here's what I'm leaving for you so that you can be a good person, grow up and, and be well in the world. Uh, the Nicomachean Ethics was uh, read and uh, studied by British officers. Uh, on, like through World War II, and may still be now, I'm not sure, but I know at least through World War II, and they had to like take exams and do well. Um, so they, they had to like memorize this book of virtues so that they would uh, practice just war and be virtuous themselves and, you know, their world conquering colonial domination of everyone. Um, okay, so uh, Aristotle begins the Nicomachean Ethics. Every art and every inquiry and similarly every action and choice is thought to aim at some good. And for this reason, the good has rightly been declared to be that at which all things aim. Sort of circular. If then there is some end of things we do, which we desire for its own sake, and if we do not choose everything for the sake of something else, clearly this must be the good and the chief good. And then later, there is general agreement both uh, from the general run of men and people of superior refinement in saying that it is happiness. And, I, and, identify, and they identify living well and faring well with being happy. So what's going on here? Um, there's some language reminiscent of language that we saw in Descartes. Uh, when Descartes is interested in the first principles of knowledge, right, that we have to have a foundation upon which we justify and base our beliefs. Similarly for Aristotle, if we're looking for the, the uh, ends of moral practice, we should look for the ends that for the sake of themselves are ubiquitous and everything, why we do it all, why we do anything at all, um, and what uh, sort of end is shared by all human activity, what sort of end can serve as a foundation to inspire anything, any human activity for the sake of itself? Uh, well, happiness, and everybody seems to agree. Uh, and this is the core principle that, um, and, and sort of the, the perspective that inspires the rest of the Nicomachean ethics and will investigate um, and sort of break down this definite uh, this, this um, paragraph as we go forward. Okay, so happiness here um, is not just like haha, I feel good. Happiness. It's a translation of a uh, Greek term term eudaimonia, uh, which conveys a connotation distinct from the English word happiness, uh, and and even from the Greek word too. That that uh, Aristotle, I think it's book chapter three in book one. Um, is a whole bunch of like possible mistakes that you might make in interpreting what he means by happiness. Um, so the etymology of, of eudaimonia is from the Greek you, you good, right? And daimon, which is your spirit. So you, your like spirit or soul, that like thing that is you is happy. It's living well. And um, today gets interpreted sort of poorly as happiness, but more precisely as flourishing, living well, doing well. 
because uh, it's not just about having pleasure and feeling good. It's about being good. Generally, that that part of your soul is is excellent, right? And this has an effect on um, the way that you live, and so it causes you to flourish in the same sort of way that if the the root system and soil is full of excellent nutrients, then you your your flower will blossom and flourish and produce fine fruit, right? Um, and uh, this term eudaimonia uh, for Aristotle does not indicate a feeling of happiness, right? It's about this flourishing and it's about flourishing that would be for any human. Uh, so it's not a subjective kind of thing that we're trying to achieve with the virtue ethics, but rather an objective one. That eudaimonia is this objective principle that all humans are capable of achieving if they just uh, grow up in the right environment and train themselves in the right sort of way, et cetera, right? Um, so again, the term can be best described as living well because anybody could live well, right? Uh, but even if you're living well, you're not always happy or if you're happy, you may not be living well in the moment, right? Um, but eudaimonia is about flourishing, living well, and it's something that is objective according to Aristotle that we can all uh, seek and achieve. So the good uh, is thought to be that end or telos is the Greek word for end here. Uh, at which all things aim. So I'm going to talk a little bit about what telos is, like it, like the end for the sake of which is a telos. Um, in Aristotle's physics, we get this distinction of causes, uh, like material physical causes, the way that the world operates. So when we're talking about causality um, earlier, uh, you know, like you can't train a rock to roll uphill by throwing it uphill a thousand times. It's just going to keep rolling down. There's a reason that the rock rolls downhill, that the motion operates in that sort of way. Um, and uh, Aristotle defines these different sort of generative causes of nature, like why things move the way that they do. Um, and when we bring in humans and rational thought capacity, we get some extra causes. So there's four causes according to Aristotle. Um, the important one for virtue is telos is the final cause. Um, but just very quickly, there's the material, efficient, formal, and final cause. Uh, so if we're looking at say like the statue of, of the David, right? Michelangelo's David. The material cause of the David being this way, existed looking like that is the marble, block of marble material cause. So you have to have the marble for there to be a David. Um, the efficient cause is uh, Michelangelo or his hammer and chisel, right? Chiseling away the marble. Uh, the formal cause is the idea of this perfect form of man present in the marble that um, uh, Michelangelo chisels away to, to get at, right? And then there's the final cause, the telos, right? The telos is the end for the sake of which, that like the, it, the, the reason that that block of marble exists, the reason that the, the chisel is carving away as it does, the reason that there's even this idea in Michelangelo's mind as he's carving away at the rock and stone uh, is for the sake of, this becoming what it, it is. And it's not like, like I have an idea of a horse and so I draw a horse. It's, it, there's something deeper in it, right? That always that idea of horse was out there sort of drawing you to, that the drawing itself was in the future, drawing you to have the inspiration to, to like put the pencil to paper and make it happen. Um, so similarly, when we're thinking about say like virtues, uh, something like courage, courage has an end for the sake of producing uh, an excellence in your behavior in say like warfare or something. Uh, and the, the courageous moment is sort of drawing you towards it if you are in tune, if you have that phrenesis, the practical wisdom, or if you've trained yourself, you have the, the character trait, right? Habituated. Um, it, it's, it's for the sake of that end that you become courageous. And what Aristotle is doing with talking about ends for the sake of which is similar to what Descartes does when he's talking about first principles and foundations of knowledge. That happiness as an end for the sake of all action is always at the end of every action that when you ask like, why'd you do that? Why'd you do that? Why'd you do that? The end of that inquiry is always gonna be happiness. Similar for Descartes, uh, how do you know that? How do you know that? How do you know that? The, event, the eventual answer is gonna be first principles. He's like clear and distinct objects of knowledge. Like I think therefore I'm the cogito, right? Um, so, uh, Aristotle is, is doing a, a similar formal project to Descartes here. Really, it should be the other way around. It's an anachronistic to say it that way because 
Descartes was well after and very much inspired by Aristotle. Um, so, so the idea of, of a telos, that for the sake of which all of our actions aren't just for the sake of the ends that they produce, but the final end of happiness being that sort of excellent result, eudaimonia happiness, living well and flourishing being why we do anything at all, okay? Um, so where there are ends apart from the actions, it is the nature of the products to be better than the activities. Um, but we should remember that just because there's an end or a telos doesn't mean that uh, you, it, what you're doing isn't an activity. Some activities are their own ends. So for instance, looking at a sunset isn't about like creating a David, you know, uh, but just like it, the end is, is in itself. That as you perform the action, looking at the sunset, the, the end is just the enjoyment, the, the, the happiness, flourishing, whatever that comes from performing that act in itself. So there doesn't need to be some sort of like productive object on the other end of an action for virtue to have this telos or for uh, an action to be virtuous, to have an end for the sake of which. It can just be in the performance of the activity that the end is achieved. Um, and in contemporary philosophy, these are called like interminable ends. Um, uh, what's her name? Uh, starts with a V. It's from University of Chicago. Anyway, she talks a lot about um, intermin interminable ends and activities with them. So um, your activity in order to have an end for the sake of which need not like produce something, but can just be intrinsically like recursively good in producing uh, flourishing. Okay. Um, there are many actions, arts and sciences, and hence many ends. Uh, so an end can be like uh, cooking a meal as a chef for your client, or uh, it can be about teaching students about the Nicomachean ethics as a philosopher, or it can be about uh, spiking a ball on your opponents playing volleyball or whatever. Um, but when these fall under a single capacity in all of these ends, the of the master arts are be preferred to the subordinate. So, so that the what, what's going on here is um, Aristotle is saying that all sorts of activities have all sorts of ends. And all of these ends share something similar, uh, which is the end for the sake of which, which is happiness, that they all sort of reduce down to this final sort of point um, that we can have, you know, like a giant tree uh, with many branches that go off in their own individual directions, but all of them find a source back to the trunk. And the trunk that holds them all together is eudaimonia, that for the sake of which the leaves grow and fall and um, fertilize. So again, this is to say that there is an objective good or, or sense of living well eudaimonia shared by all human beings, which might just originally, like right off the bat, be controversial. We might think like, hell no, there's no like good that is good for everybody. Um, and this is, this is a big problem that uh, virtue ethicists grapple with. Um, in, in the universal sort of quality or nature of eudaimonia as the criterion of what counts as good. So if we're saying that all normative evaluation is reliant upon this shared human end of living well and flourishing, um, you might say that that's fine. Like we, we can all agree to that. We're all trying to like live our best lives. Do you boo, right? Um, but what that means, like what that consists in, that eudaimonia state, um, Aristotle thinks it's like pretty rigid, right? Uh, but knowing what we know now uh, about the inadequacy of uh, uh, evolutionary biology to define human nature, um, about the uh, caprice of moral attitudes based on um, social trends and, and whatnot that, you know, we might be a little more relativist than Aristotle wanted to be. And, and so building in a relativism to this objective concept of living well is a big challenge that virtue ethicists today face. So that's book one, um, that all ends of activities aim at this one thing. Uh, book two is uh, what is good for human beings? What is the human good? How do we identify it? What is this eudaimonia sort of thing? Um, so if there is a human good, it should have two features. One, human good is a goal that we pursue for its own sake, not for the sake of anything else, right? Just like a first principle uh, can act as a, a formal epistemological foundation for belief, just as long as it doesn't rely on any other belief or whatever. Um, 
Two, for any other goal which we pursue, we pursue that goal for the sake of the human good. So we might want to make a sandwich as a chef for a customer or client so that I can make money, so that I can pay my bills, so that uh, I can live happily ever after with my family behind our white picket fence or whatever. So in some, if there is a human good, it is the ultimate end of all of our actions, that all of our actions and their motivations will boil down and reduce to this concept of living well. Okay, um, and here's where we get some controversies. I just mentioned like wanting to build in, so, <laughs> um, wanting to build in some um, relativism to the idea of uh, eudaimonia and, and uh, Aristotle's virtue ethics. So um, Aristotle says, our discussion will be adequate if it has as much clearness as the subject matter admits of for precision is not to be sought for alike in all discussions. <clears throat> we must be content then in speaking of such objects to indicate the truth roughly and an outline. And in the same spirit, therefore, we should, uh, therefore should each type of statement be received for it is the mark of an educated man to look for precision in each class of things just so far as the nature of the subject admits. And the end of this discussion is, uh, is aimed at not knowledge, but rather action, meaning that one who hasn't had enough experience of action, you know, like a very young person, uh, may be a biased judge of ethical truth. So Aristotle is uh, around this passage saying that, look, I'm not talking to anybody who is not a 14-year-old land-owning and thus member of the Greek assembly voting male, someone who lives in the political society of Greece at the time, who is educated, and who uh, thinks like me, because all of the best people that I know are this way, therefore um, this must be like the virtues that we're, we're about. Now, that's not strictly speaking the argument he makes, but he does say these things. He says like, look, you can't be virtuous if you're not older than 14, if you're not male, and if you are not a member of the assembly. These are the only sorts of people that will be virtuous. Um, and Aristotle gets in today's reading of him in a lot of trouble for this. Now, I talked about it earlier. Um, I won't defend Aristotle on that point because I, I think it's indefensible. However, I will say that, that he's not, I, I don't think we should throw Aristotle out, you know, like throw the, what, what's the idiom? I don't know, bird out with the bushes or baby out with the bathwater. Yeah, bird bushes, baby bathwater shouldn't be throwing any small cute creatures with any larger destructive object. Um, similarly with Aristotle. I don't think that Aristotle's proclamation that these virtues um, are for these specific people um, and thus like gatekeeps the, the system of philosophy breaks it. I think that it's just a challenge for us to say, how do we subtract that and make it work better for us? Because there's a lot to really like in this. Um, there's a lot of value to be found in virtue ethics and a lot to be inspired by um, in Aristotle's initial working through it. Um, and, and so I feel personally that the, the controversy uh, is justified in objection. Um, that is in saying like, there's something wrong here. Uh, but I also think that it should be an inspiration for us to do better work to say, look where he failed and look what we can do better, right? Um, and that means uh, rebuilding the system of virtue ethics so that it is inclusive and not gatekept to um, people that don't exist anymore. 14 year old plus male assembly members of ancient Greece. There's nobody like that anymore. Um, so, it, you know, th th there's controversy, but but I, I think that there is also a lot to like, and, and it's you know worth pointing that out so you can you know come to your own conclusions and um, you know do your own evaluations. Uh, so, book four: Is there such a human good? Is there a human good at which all ends of our activity aims? Well, yes, it's happiness and eudaimonia. Uh, so, is Aristotle positing the existence of something far removed from our everyday thoughts? Right? Is this like? eudaimonic state, something like heaven that you know, nobody's ever been there, but a whole lot of people think it's there and is, you know, where you pray and go to church every Sunday or whatever to, to get there. Um, is, is this good, this basis upon which we do all of our moral evaluating, something that 
is like that, is far away and removed and not a part of our active everyday lives or um, not. Um, and no, it's not. Um, eudaimonia is what we would normally call happiness, but um, with this ultimate telos attached, it's something that we believe in, that we have in everyday life, that we can see in, in our heroes, unlike that we we might be able to find in the, the heroes, moral saints of deontology and utilitarianism. We can look at people who are flourishing and living well and pick out the character traits that have led them to live those good lives, um, as long as we are not blinded by materialism, right? Because there's a lot of bad people that live well, but not with excellent souls. Okay, so happiness is the only thing that meets the criteria for being an ultimate good, something that we all share, that we all strive for, that we all want, um, the end of all human aims. Uh, it's the only goal pursued for its own sake. We pursue happiness because it's good in itself, period. Um, it's good for us, it's good in general. Um, but happiness, book five now, or chapter five now of book one, uh, is not pleasure. It's not just about feeling good, because you can feel good and not be flourishing, right? You can be um, a meth addict chewing your air biscuits down at the 7-Eleven, right, at four in the morning, and you're probably not flourishing. You might feel like you are, pleasure, but you're not really living well with this excellent sort of soul if you're trapped in a cycle of uh, you know, addiction and air biscuit chewing. Um, pretty common sight in Oklahoma. Um, nor is it honor. Happiness isn't just about like being honored by flourishing. The eudaimonia here being happiness I'm talking about. Eudaimonia isn't just about honor. It's not about other people saying, you, you that you are doing it right. Uh, you may not be, you may not feel like it. you may not have in you. You may just look, you may outwardly present um, to the world that everything is going just swell, but is not. So um, is anybody familiar with the poem, Richard Corey? No, how about online? Does, does anybody know the poem Richard Corey? No, hey, Google it. This is an example of everything looking just fine and not being just fine. It's really short too, isn't it? You know, it's not gonna take up more than two minutes of your time. Um, nor is it uh, just the possession of virtue. It, the virtue has to be in action. You have to be producing um, good actively. Um, these things and everything else we do gets uh, their value because of its contribution to happiness, um, or as Sarah Brody puts it, um, uh, all other goods are value dependent on the ultimate good, right? So happiness uh, in terms of pleasure or honor, in terms of being respected socially, or um, just having like these capacities at all um, is uh, for the sake of this eudaimonic flourishing state and not for the sake of themselves, the eudaimonic state is what everything bottoms out in. Okay, so um, eudaimonia meets our criterion of this end at which all human uh, activities aim. So now such a thing, happiness, eudaimonia, above all else is held to be, uh, for this we choose always for itself and never for the sake of something else, but honor, pleasure, reason, and every excellence we choose indeed for themselves, or if nothing resulted from them, we should still choose each of them. But we choose them for the sake of happiness, judging that through them we shall be happy. Happiness, on the other hand, no one chooses for the sake of these, nor in general for anything other than itself. Uh, we choose to be honored so that we can be uh, uh, living well, so that we can be in a state of eudaimonia. We uh, choose pleasure so that we can live well. But what we're really doing is um, subtending to that ultimate goal of eudaimonia. So uh, happiness in a strong sense of the word, not just an emotional state, but is true fulfillment, is the realization of the excellence of the soul. So we know that human good is what we commonly refer to by the term happiness, but we don't yet know what happiness is. What is this like state of living well and flourishing really consistent? As Aristotle puts it, to say that happiness is the chief good seems a platitude, right? Like, hey, we, happiness is good, right? Go for it. Um, and a clear account of what it is is still desired. This might perhaps be given if we could first ascertain the function of man. So what is it that makes us live well and be happy? Well, not just like 
hey, it's good for you because that's a platitude. We want to give content to that. This is what philosophy is all about, right? In, in everything. It's not just about conceptualizing or giving this sort of overview or model. It's about putting the meat on the bones. It's drawing the connections, making inferences and saying um, that this concept exists and it, this is how it works and operates, right? So this is what Aristotle is now doing with eudaimonia. Um, for just as for a flute player, a sculptor, or any artist, and in general, for us, for all things that have a function or activity, the good and the well is thought to reside in the function. So it would seem to be for man if he has a function. Here we have an argument by analogy. Um, what makes the flute player a good flute player? They have nimble fingers. Uh, they make mellif mellifluous sounds. Uh, they, they can do this, what, what's it called? Like where you breathe in and out, you know, like you don't, you never stop breathing, circular breathing. You can do circular breathing, right? These are the functions of good flute playing. And we can say that a flute player does well when they have all of these properties that, like built into their activity. So if this is what makes flute playing good, then maybe we can do the same thing, says Aristotle, with humans. What, what is human activity consistent? What makes us do well? Uh, well, it's our function. And what's our function? And this is where we get the ergon argument. Ergon is the Greek word for function. Okay, So if we're going to find out what the ultimate good for human being is, so if we're going to fill in this concept of eudaimonia, what we commonly refer to as happiness then, uh, we must look at the function of a human being uh, because uh, a thing's goodness must be specific to its nature. Like every time I put this under the table, it loses its connection, which is so peculiar. Um, okay, so whenever we're trying to figure out what a good X is, insert anything for X, uh, we first look at the function of it. So a good X is one which performs its function as of X well. So to find out what the good for an X is, we first look at the function. Uh, have the carpenter then and the tanner certain functions or activities uh, and has man none? Is he naturally functionless? Or as eye, hand, foot, and in general, each of the parts evidently has a function, may one lay it down that man similarly has a function apart from all of these? Um, let's answer this question. Let's like to take a pause and answer this question. Do we think that the carpenter, the flute player, the tanner, and the human in general are similar sorts of things? Yeah, they're, they're kind of not, right? How about um, my hand, my arm, my hair, my eyelids, and the human in general? Are these the same sort of thing? No, they, but they all functions, right? My eyelids keep my eyes from drying out. My hands hold things. Um, I pull the spaghetti out of my pockets on occasion. Um, it, right, so, so, so what Aristotle is doing is drawing analogies. He's saying, look, the human being is kind of like the carpenter and the tanner. The human being is kind of like the hand and the arm in, insofar as they each have a function. Um, and we might think that the analogy breaks down a little bit, uh, which is an objection to this, right? It's a place to sort of jump off the boat. Uh, Aristotle thinks that they are sufficiently similar. Um, oops. So both within human society and within the individual human, so the job of the human or the job of a body part, um, the functions of all of the parts work together in a unified way. Uh, the, the hand works with the arm to pull the spaghetti out of my pockets, right? I couldn't do the one without the other. Similarly, the carpenter and the tanner uh, require one another in order to um, like have a good, you have to have bankers and chefs and teachers and you know all sorts of different professions to work together to you know make it possible to live in a society at all. Um, and they couldn't work together in this unified way unless the functions of each part of the human being um, derived from and contributed to an overall function of being human in society or in an individual body at all. So um, here we might start to feel a little more convinced that there is an analogy that uh, what it is to function as a human is not to be like one particular part, right? To be like the carpenter in particular, or to be like 
the hand in particular, but rather to be sort of like the unified thing that works because all of the parts come together. That the human is sort of like that. We have a function and our function is in the unification of all sorts of different properties, both social and individual coming together to create a system or a whole that is able to manage and operate itself. So we can conclude that one, if the parts of a human society or individual have functions, then the whole must have a function. Two, the parts of human society and individual bodies do have functions. Therefore, the human, uh, both socially and individually, has a function. We, we got a function. Right. So go into the function. You might hear something like this. Um, so as Aristotle says, what then can this function be? Life seems to be common even to plants. Uh, like I'm alive and a plant is alive, so we share that. Uh, but we're seeking what is peculiar uh, to man. Let us exclude, therefore, the life of nutrition and growth, because plants have that and animals have that, but we're different from both of those. Um, next, there would be the life of perception, but it also seems to be common even to the horse, the ox, and every animal. There remains then an active life of the element that has a rational principle. Of this, one part has such a principle in the sense of being obedient to one the other in the sense of possessing one and exercising thought. And this too can be taken in two ways. We must state that life in the sense of activity is what we mean for this seems to be the proper sense of the term. So uh, here we get a little bit of Aristotelian taxonomy of soul or like the human uh, body. Uh, so it's like, this is, kind of, this is actually like a misspelling. Um, the soul in Greek is suke, S-U-K-K-E. Um, psyche might be like a kind of different conception of it, but the reason the Greek word for soul is suke is because it's supposed to be like the sound, and this may be like, you know, just a total wives tale or whatever, but um, it, suke is supposed to be the sound of your final breath leaving your body, which like carried your soul with it. Suke, and then you die, right? Um, kind of fun. Anyways, um, so we have a tripartite soul, a three-part soul, according to Aristotle. There's a non-rational part, the nutritive part, that part that we share with plants, right? So plants also have a nutritive part of their soul. Um, we also have a semi-rational, there's like an appetitive desire-based part of the soul um, shared with, say, like animals. Uh, and then there's a purely rational part of the soul, which is just human. Um, and later on, like book 10 or so, this is why we get sort of the, the priority of contemplative virtues, virtues of the mind, intellectual virtues over the character ones, because that's what's like the true function of humans is to have this rational soul and to use it. Um, and its use is best done with intellectual virtues, but we're also tripartite. We have other bits too. And then so the character virtues are important as well. Um, okay. So uh, the function of a human being uh, must involve acting and not just having the capacity to act in a way that no lower level creatures or animals can react, which has to do with our purely rational part of the tripartite soul and its relation to appetitive, our appetitive nature, our desires, uh, meaning like our ability to like move and want things and, and act. Okay. Um, well, why? Well, this is true for the function of NEX. The function of a carpenter is not to breathe or to eat, but to like build chairs and tables and stuff, right? What makes that person a carpenter and a good carpenter is that activity that is characteristic of the, the profession. Similar for a human, uh, it wouldn't be to be alive um, or function. Uh, it would be what makes us a, it's specifically this, which is to exercise the rational part of our soul, okay? Um, so what's left is reason, right? Um, and not just the possession of reason, but it's activity. So you could have, again, like a capacity for rational activity, but never use it. And I, I don't know. It, I wanna like make a Chris Pratt joke, but I feel like he's a nice person, so I won't. Um, so as Aristotle says, there remains then an active life of the element that has a rational principle, activity in accordance with reason. This is the function of being human. Uh, and so what are the activities of reason that end at, uh, that, that find an end in uh, flourishing or eudaimonia is the development of virtues. So here's the argument in full. One, 
if the parts of human society um, or the parts of individual humans have functions, then the whole of those things must have a function. The parts of a human individual or society do have functions, therefore uh, a human society or individual has a function. Uh, four, if a human society or individual being has a function, its function is an activity which it doesn't share with any lower level being. The only activity that human society or individual doesn't share with any lower level thing is that of reason. Therefore, the function of being human uh, is activity in accordance with reason. What do you think? Are we right? Did Aristotle nail it? Humans aren't the only creatures that use reason. Yeah, good. Uh, so you might think that uh, interaction with humans or maybe just like dolphins are pretty smart and they can reason. So what we mean by reason and if there's uh, a way to measure reason as scalar, so saying like you can be more and less on a scale of reason. Um, and if there's a difference in kind uh, with respect to difference in uh, degree, right? So at some point, do you like flip over from, you have a capacity for reason to you are a rational animal, right? Um, one way of rectifying the Aristotelian project would be to make an argument like that. Say, yeah, a dolphin can think rationally, but um, it, it's a different kind of reason than human reason because we're like, chained to it, whereas the dolphin can just go be an animal sometimes too. But this is like an empirical question. And you might just think that, well, no, there's, there's no way to distinguish between um, capacities of reason. And uh, so there's nothing that makes us distinctly human. And the whole argument about function requiring some distinctly human trait uh, fails for that reason. The, the remember the idea here is like uh what's the function of being a carpenter is not to eat or breathe like uh what does a carpenter do stuff. yeah they make stuff right but uh if you had said eat food i said what <laughs> that that wouldn't have been it would have been like a non-answer right that that when i ask you for the definition of the concept, you give me like the principal activity of it um, that makes it different from every other profession. Uh, and so similarly, if humans share some function with lower order animals, plants, life forms, or whatever, um, then to say that the function of being a human is something that is also shared by one of those lower order life forms, um, wouldn't be to pick out what is distinctly human. Yeah, so it's, it's a good question. And it's what our first objection picked against, right? So the idea here is that what is distinctly human, rational activity can be shared by other animals. And so there is nothing that's distinctly human or could be nothing. And so um, when we're trying to say what the function of being a human is, we could never point to it should be an issue. You asked for carpenter, might they just say that their function is to eat? Like they do carpentry because they need a job. So maybe- That's why they do it, but what it is that they do? Right. It seems like there's some way to broaden that, but yeah. Yeah, so, so these are objections to um, what for? Yeah. How about anybody online? Any objections to this argument? Number two also. Number two, the parts of human society do have functions. You could at least argue that some of the parts of an individual don't have. Functions. Oh yeah, there's like vestigial parts as well. Yeah, so this is kind of an interesting one. Um, I wonder what Aristotle would say about like vestigial bodies or whatever, you know, like pinky toes 
for like male nipples, right? They, they don't serve, a, they're like leftovers of you know, some other biological function, like in the past. Um, I think, I mean, I know that Aristotelian scholasticism inspires um, a lot of the like OG Catholic church thinking that it's all like sort of perfect and held together. Um, and it isn't until like the Copernican revolution that we even get rid of the idea that like the heavenly bodies move in perfect circles, which also comes from Aristotle, right? Aristotle is like also the first astronomer um, uh, or among the first, I suppose, but like the first like actual write it down and codify astronomy astronomer. Um, so I, I don't know what to say about this, right? I, I'm not an Aristotle scholar. If you guys are interested in these like deeper kinds of questions, um, Anne Peterson is our Aristotle scholar here. She's awesome, She's absolutely fantastic. Um, but I, I, so if that's like the tradition that follows from Aristotle's scholasticism, then I, I think Aristotle might be committed to the idea that there are no such thing as vestigial bodies, that every like part is, is a part of the perfect whole and has its function and place in it. Um, so like a vestigial tail or pinky toe or the male nipple or whatever um, would, they must have functions maybe, and, and I'm not sure, right? But I could see that being the case. And if it were, then this would be a pretty strong objection to say, well, look, there's just objects in the world that are purposeless. Cool. Anybody else before we move on? Okay. All right, so what is the human good? For all things that have a function or activity, the good and the well is thought to reside in the function, so it would be for man. And now we know that the human function is according to Aristotle, it's this rational activity of the soul, okay? Um, so the good of a human being must be done in accordance with reason, done well, or with excellence, erite, virtue, right? Um, just as a good carpenter doesn't build unstable things or a flute player play out of tune, uh, so a good human, uh, not only performs their function, acting rationally, but performs it excellently, really well, with virtue. Um, so happiness, eudaimonia, is the human good at which all of our activities aim, uh, and it involves reason, activities of reason, in conformity with excellence, erite, virtue. Um, so again, Sarah Brody, Aristotelian scholar. This isn't motivated in a way that would convince, for example, Thrasymachus, a character in Plato's Republic, um, or the lover of pleasure, uh, the, the hedonist. Um, because whether, whether because this seems a fruitless dialectic or for some other reason, Aristotle makes no effort to strengthen his starting point in this way. So Aristotle isn't trying to convince the hedonist that this is what everything is all about. He's trying to convince, well, he's, he's just trying to tell his son like how to be a good person, right? Um, and so he's sort of not interested in objectors or people who share alternative intuitions. He's just kind of claiming that everybody um, acts for the sake of flourishing and not simple pleasure, not hedonic pleasure, um, but we're all actually interested in this greater, more um, important, deeper kind of pleasure, flourishing, living well, eudaimonia. Um, and Aristotle doesn't really do much besides stipulate this, right? This just is sort of put out there. And it's that uh, idea upon which the rest of his system of ethics is based. Um, so different possibilities, he's, Aristotle is following his usual methodology of trying to make common sense view work. And we see this in all of Aristotle's writings. The beginning begins with the indoxa. It's the given beliefs of the society at the time. And he doesn't try to refute them. He tries to edit the, the given beliefs so that they can become consistent with the empirical world that he sees so much clearer than all of his contemporaries. And so this might be similar too, that everybody thinks like, we're all just trying to like live good lives, you know, be our best selves. Um, so if, if this is uh, not a carefully considered, like analytic argued for position, it's just stipulated, at least it has the strength of the indoxa, the given belief, the, the sort of common sensicality principle behind it to, to strengthen it in that sort of way. Um, but it does leave one to question, like what 
what really is this flourishing thing if we are to make it more relative, if we are to sort of uh, break down the gates that Aristotle sets up around it, that if we're to say that it is objective and universal that we all are, all are trying to do uh, good in the sense of living well flourishing, um, but that can look a lot of different ways. So what might be uh, virtue here, maybe vice there, right? Like what the mean is will switch in different situations. If we wanna explain this kind of uh, relativism, it's not inconsistent with the virtue ethical project, uh, but it does take some finagling. So it requires things like uh, exemplarist virtue ethics where eudaimonia isn't this state to which only certain people can attain uh, or a state that anybody could attain, but it looks the same in every case. Uh, but rather um, it's individual though generalizable. Um, and what we do is we just find a hero. We say, I wanna be a person like that. And that's how you learn what virtues are and what living well looks like. Um, and this is a new popular um, form of virtue ethics that's out there. Um, so we'll, we'll end with a quote, it's kind of a cool one. Uh, Aristotle says, excellent activities or their opposites are what determine happiness or the reverse. Now many events happen by chance and events dip differing in importance, small pieces of good fortune or its opposite, clearly do not weigh down the scales of life one way or the other, but a multitude of great events, if they turn out well, will make life more blessed. Well, if they turn out ill, they crush and maim blessedness. Yet even in these nobility shines, shines through when a man bears with resignation many great misfortunes, not through insensibility to pain, but through nobility and greatness of soul. For the man who is truly good and wise, we think bears all the chances of life becomingly and always makes the best of the circumstances. As a good general makes the best military of, of the army at his command and a shoemaker makes the best shoes out of the hides that are given him. Um, and this is kind of like the idea of virtue, virtue ethics, right? Is, you know, do your best, come what may. Right? That's the whole goal. And what we mean by do your best is controversial, open to interpretation, argument and change, but do your best, come what may, and can we generalize these principles and share them with one another so that we can live excellently and virtuously with one another? Um, it might not help us in the case of whether or not to pull a lever, you know, trolley problem, but maybe it makes a world in which pulling levers is a little less um, likely to be a moral problem we run into. Okay, that's the end. Oh, yeah. <laughs>